Yeah, good morning. So, um, before you wonder what I have dangling around my neck, this is a very tiny braille computer. It's a device and it's also my timekeeper. So, I have to start it now. Okay. And it's starting now and it's on 18 minutes. And that means I can start. Yeah, I would like to start with a quote of Michelangelo. And now listen carefully, because I think it's very important for all of you who have big dreams. Michelangelo said, the biggest danger is not to dream big and fail, but to dream small and succeed. Now, this quote is the starting quote every year when we start our seven months program in the Kantari Institute in Kerala. The Kantari Institute is an institute for social change makers, for social visionaries, for people who come from the margins of society, people who have overcome adversity one day in their life, who had a pinching point, who, who say it's enough, who have a dream for social change. And all these people, they have been told, stay on the ground, don't grab for the stars. You are too small for these big ideas. Now, most of the people would give up when they hear this. And some are persistent. The question is, why are they persistent? And this is what I would like to look at today. Um, in our Kantari Institute, we have several people from the margins, as I said already, people who come from very poor backgrounds, but also people who come from rich backgrounds, but who have experienced social ill or difficulties or challenges. For example, we have one uh, person from India, and he is coming from the, the higher middle class. He went to elite university, and he came out of this elite university with flying colors, and he said, this was a complete waste of time. I want to change the educational system in India. Now he started DeFi, which is um, a program for schools without teachers. Very, very interesting people, charismatic people from all around the world. Another one is Punhoi Tang from Meghalaya. Meghalaya is one of the poorest regions in uh, India. It's northeast. And um, actually, Punhoi, when she was little, she had an allergy in her eye, and she went to a healer, to a witch doctor. And the witch doctor put acid and soot into the eye, and she turned almost blind. Now, this didn't... Um, well, it changed her life drastically because she dropped out of school, but it didn't change her dream. She wanted to do something for society. And actually, I would like to introduce Pinhoi to you, and please have the first film. My father have killed Let's see. a tiger which is 12 feet. That area, there is no more animals. There is no more jungle. Oh, bitch. Okay. This is the village where I grew up. And when I, when I was small, I dropped from the school later on because I have a problem with uh, low vision. And uh, my mom was like, she cannot support me anymore. I just keep on crying all the time at home. I asked my mom, like, please send me to school. I want to study. I get a chance to go to the villages, uh, visiting the people uh, in the village who is having uh, difficult difficulties, like a person with disability in different area. Like nobody helped them. I just feel that I would just want to do something, but I don't know what to do. We come across Kantari. Kantari is a place where I finish another um, 
another area of my study where I really love that place and I really get confident and uh, I develop my dreams. We go to the field, go for home base, teach the child according to the need. We spread the, the project through the CBR approach to advocacy, a mental health program, formation of DPO organization. My name is Daniel. I'm coming from the Mulong. So I have three jobs, <laughs> cane and bamboo and mobile repairing and cyber cave. They had done getting shot on board. They long are packing Nadu Katakapur and last dump and mud, Yakiniki, Jing, Kijing Bom Sutanatu, more, Kijing Sobha, Hagging Im Janga. You miss Penhoi, Lawan Chanisha for Pahamrio, a Yang Janga. Nagabenta, Ban Pensha, Shapanka, a sip and training, a lay a training, Bakery, Ha, Shillong, a Nriobanai, Mawan Pai, Shi Ying. Dangalawan Pai Shing, the Nadon Yakajing Trang Nagabanta Bangan Seng Yalaga Yakabekiri. Then a town the Bun Gilat Kumno Bangan Yob and Lay Yakabekiri Hakataka Namarang Walang a long Gabriel of the Duna and Ray Nadon Yakaman Sam Baskem and Yang Halaki Jongi Kijan. I have a lot of opportunity to develop myself, to understand what I really want to do. My decision is I can. Uh, make a decision on my own and I just feel that what uh, I just want the others of my friend also to grow as I grow and have an opportunity uh, to uh, to express themselves and to learn more in the society to be with the society so this is Punhoi and uh, Punhoi is one of the people who show us that actually you can come from a very, very uh, disadvantaged um, background, but still you can achieve big, big dreams. Now, the question is how are people perceiving their dreams? And there are a few things. Um, we probably are going to, or I want to, to look at a few things that these people have in common we are claiming rights, four major rights, simple rights, not rights like I need privileges or I need uh, support, very, very simple human rights. For example, one right, the right to be different without being disabled. Another one, the right to voice our opinion, the right to risk, and the right to take over responsibility. When I look at the first right, when I became blind with the age of uh, 12, I received a blind pass in Germany and it said 100% disabled. So what does that mean, 100% disabled? Does it mean that I'm 100% useless? And yes, if, I, if my dream was to become a bus driver, I would be 100% useless. But if I want to start and run an institute, actually blindness could be an advantage. Now, um, when we look at disability from the bird's eye perspective, think of an eagle flying over us, circling over us, looking down at us. What does this eagle see? A person with very long legs, very long arms, not able to fly, not able to swim very elegantly, very fast, not a actually not able to see, to spot a worm from 40 meters above. You know what? We all, all of us here who are sitting in this room, we have to face it. We are all disabled. Yeah? We are all pretty much visually impaired and hearing disabled, and flying disabled. But what does it do with us? Does it frustrate us? No way. We become creative. We become innovative. We create flying objects, and speedboats, and microscopes. And this 
actually gave me the understanding that imperfection is the mother of invention. Now, looking at the second right, the right to voice our opinion. When I was in university, I was uh, the student representative in university, and we had, one day we had um, a request of the German army, the Bundeswehr. They wanted to celebrate their 40 years anniversary in our courtyard. And we, peacemakers, were protesting. So I went to the Senate, I was asked to go to the Senate and to make a speech about peace and why there is no link between the Bundeswehr and the university. And I did. And you know what I heard? One dean leaned over to the other one and said, blind und dann noch die Klappe aufreißen. First she's blind and then she wants to open her mouth. This statement made me very happy because I knew that I had a meaning in life. I had the meaning to be or to become an obstacle. Now, the third right that we have to claim, the third right is the right to risk. Well, um, I studied Tibetology because I wanted to risk something. I wanted to get out of Germany, I wanted to have adventure, um, and I wanted to do something meaningful. I created a script for the Tibetan language, and off I went to Tibet and found out something about Tibetan blind people. And first of all, I found out that a lot of Tibetans think that blindness is the worst punishment that can happen to you. And people believe that blind people must have done something really terribly wrong in their past life. And thus, blind Tibetans don't have a lot of self-confidence. Longwa is actually a curse word. Now, when I found out about this, and when I talked to many blind people in Tibet, I went on horseback through Tibet, um, I wanted to create a school. That is not like a school. I, I'm not so fond of schools, I must say. But a school that is much more like a springboard, where these blind Tibetan children can get all the empowerment and all the abilities they need to jump back into society and say, yes, I'm blind, so what? I can do so many things. Maybe I cannot go to the kiosk and buy a newspaper and read it, but I can do something that sighted people can never dream of doing, for example, reading and writing in the dark. I met Paul, and together, Paul from Holland, he is an engineer, social engineer, and together we started the first school for the blind in Tibet, which also later became a farm, and um, yeah, and it, uh, it became a, a great project for us to understand that change had to come from within. I, as a blind person, could be much more credible to start the school for the blind. Nowadays, this school is taken over by our blind students that we have raised, and they show to the society again that they can take their own lives in their own hands. And this is so important. Um, a lot of these kids became very successful, much more successful than their sighted brothers and sisters who went to regular schools. And the question is, why did they become so successful? A lot of them, they are running their businesses, they are running social entrepreneurships, they are running kindergartens for blind and sighted people. Why are they so successful in a society that is so blind and friendly? And there are several reasons for that. These children or these blind young adults now, they have nothing to lose but their dignity. They come out of nothing. Nobody expects anything from them. They can risk something. Also, they don't have the, um, the need to become everybody's darling. Nowadays, a lot of children are raised to be a good girl, a good boy. How limiting is that? 
Let's be naughty boy. Let's think differently. Let's um, stand up in society and say we don't have to be disabled because we are different, because we are thinking different. These kids don't have to be everybody's darling. Also, what they learned is to be ethical. That's something they learned in our school in Lhasa in Tibet. To be on time. And this in a society where not everybody is on time. It's a, it's a great advantage. Um, not to make excuses. Not to lie. But then also they learned how to follow their visions. To believe in their dreams because we, we believed in their dreams. And to dream big. And when we saw that actually these kids who are from the margins of society, or who were always ostracized, who were always outcasts, when we saw that they became so successful, we thought, why not starting a venture, an institute, for people from the margins, for people who have overcome challenges, overcome um, uh, um, adversity in their life? Why not? going somewhere central in the world, and Kerala, the south of India, in our eyes is very central in the world. If you just look at the, the world map, it's hanging in there, just right between Africa on one hand and Asia on the other hand. Kantari, the center, um, is called after a chili. This chili is very, very small, but very spicy. Now. This chili is not just spicy, it has also medicinal values. So it can lower the blood pressure, it's, um, yeah, it's a painkiller, it makes you very, very awake. Just like the Kantaris, the social change makers. They might seem small, but they are very successful, they are very spicy, and they have fire in the belly and enough energy and spice to question the status quo. To walk, uh, to walk their talk, to understand that they just have to follow their dream. Many of our participants are very, very successful. The graduates, 70% are already running their projects successfully, and they are reaching more than 12,000 direct beneficiaries already. Now, we um, we have a lot of people from various different areas. We have disabled and non-disabled. And for the last moment, I would like to show you one more story of Shristi. Shristi is a blind dancer. She was a blind dancer. Uh, she was a dancer. She was first sighted, and then she became blind. And she actually realized that she is blind because she fell from the stage. And there she understood that her dance career is maybe done. But now she came to us, she came to Kantari, and she started an organization which is Blind Rocks. She wants to start the first dance school, the first actor's school for the blind in Nepal. Please have the second video with Shristi. You can hear it, you can feel it, you can do it. There are three sets of workshops that we provide, especially traveling all around the world, partnering with the like-minded organization. The first is interpersonal skill. Here we focus on body language, body movement, gesture, posture, facial expressions, emotions, because this is especially the problem for the born blind people when the world is dependent upon this visual when we can't see we can't learn and nobody thinks it's necessary to teach and the second is dance fashion and beauty being a dancer myself i love dancing and now i want other blind also to dance we actually want the blind people to dance so that they don't need to sit in a corner while they are in a picnic or a party the third workshop we provide is adventurous trip like rock climbing rafting paragliding hiking you rafting my Zanum, Vandagari, Molamir Gorbata, Nozo, one not here. Mozansu, Mirsatu, Sobi, totally blind Tatios and was some of the Siku Dixini, one that I am a force got in. Blind rocks. Also, to create the mindset change in the society. Everybody faces challenges, and especially we as a blind and a disabled 
are really good in overcoming challenges and transforming it into the assets. We, as a blind, also live a rocking life. Blind rocks the world. Blind rocks the world. Blind rocks the world. Aha, uh aha. -huh, uh -huh. It's like that? Is it like that or what? Blind rocks the world. Let's rock the world. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs>